an exercise in something. I'm not sure what. Call the work session of the Isabella County Board of Commissioners to order. Stand for the pledge, please. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, a roll call, please. Commissioner Hutchinson? Present. Commissioner Embry? Present. Commissioner Jalzinski? Present. Commissioner Ingler? Here. Reno? Here. Commissioner Sweeney? Here. Here. Chairman? Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, next up will be approval of the agenda. We'll have general public comment uh, under presentations and special reports. We have Peer 360 Recovery Alliance. Um, we have one appointment to the Isabella County Jury Board uh, and then committee reports, Finance and Administration Committee. Finance Administration Committee is all set, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, Criminal Justice and County Affairs Committee. The Criminal Justice and County Affairs Committee is all set, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, Human Resources and Public Works Committee. Human Resources and Public Works Committee is all set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We have no intergovernmental affairs, no administrator controller issues under unfinished, no unfinished business under new business. Uh, we have a resolution honoring the Michigan Association of Counties. Uh, and then we will consider a special meeting for goal setting. Uh, and then we'll have another opportunity for general public comment, announcements and adjournment. So with that, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Support. And moved and supported. All those in favor, say aye. 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 We have an agenda. And next up would be general public comment. Is there anyone for general public comment? You have anyone online, Michelle? We do not. Okay. Uh, then we'll move right along to presentations and special reports. Peer 360 Recovery Alliance. Bowden and Anna Winters. Right up, right up there, sir. Okay. Okay, so what do you want to do this? Do you want them to be seen first? Up to you, you, so yeah, you want to share your screen to show the presentation. Yeah, I was just uh, I want him to see your face and then I'll <laughs> presentation up because you got to sit right here. I have to sit, yeah. uh oh, you don't have to sit through the presentation. <laughs> I, I want to stand up and move around, but I've got butterflies. There we go. Okay, <laughs> there's a camera on the laptop, so that's what she's trying to get stressed in, but um. Oh, there you go. You want this? You want the whole video? The whole thing showing? It's it's already shown. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on a second. All right. Well, I really have to stand. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Ricardo Bob. I'm a person in long-term sustained recovery. What that means to me is I haven't used drugs and alcohol for 25 years. Um, and importantly, what that has meant. I'm sorry. Um, would you mind using the mic so that our people on YouTube can hear you? All right. Okay. Do it again. <laughs> so, my name is Ricardo Bowden. I'm a person in long-term sustained recovery. What that means to me is I have not used any alcohol or any other drugs for over 25 years. Importantly, what that has meant, I have a 30-year-old son 
who's always been able to rely on me and has my trust. Um, it also means I get, I get the benefit, the dubious benefit of paying taxes every year. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, by the way, and I was driving over here today. I had a good attitude. I didn't flip, no, flip the bird to nobody. I was a, a pleasant participant on the road. And that's how life is for me today. Hi, my name is Anna Winters. Uh, hopefully you can hear me good. Okay, and I am also a person in long-term recovery. Um, what that means to me today is I get to walk with honesty and integrity in my recovery journey. Um, I get to show my children what a healthy parent looks like, um, which they haven't unfortunately always had. And this June 5th, I will have three years in recovery. And I'm very proud of that. And I've been working with uh, Peer 360 Recovery Alliance for the past two years. So that's all I got. Thank you. Oh, and the next slide. I'm sorry. I'll introduce the next slide. So this just, I'll just briefly go over this. So it says Minobamadzwin, which I'm a tribal member from the Lakuteri tribe in Wisconsin, but I work closely with the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe um, in Isabella County here. And so Minobamadzwin is Ojibwe language, and it means to live in a good way. And so that is sort of the message that we relay to everybody when they come into recovery is just to live in a good way today, make whatever means to you. Uh, to live in a good way today. And that's where the focus is. And so we just like to begin in a good way today by saying thank you um, for having us here and for Jessica and Nicole for doing all, making all the connections and everything to make this uh, an opportunity for us to be here, which we're really grateful for. So thank you for that. So let me share with you a little bit about 56 Recovery Alliance. So as our elevator speech says, um, we exist to put a face and a voice on recovery so that we can make the recovery journey easier and more accessible for more people. That's, what, that's our, all, our, our primary goal. We are all on our staff, individuals who are in recovery ourselves. Given that peerness, we are able to break down barriers with people, walk with people, have the power and the patience with folk as they do this really, really tough journey, moving from being actively ill to find themselves to increase wellness. All of our staff are trained peer recovery coaches. Um, each recovery coach to get certified has to go through an initial five day training. Um, and in addition to that, we do continue ongoing professional development trainings. The four primary roles a recovery coach brings to the table is that we are all about promoting recovery. We believe in the reality and the possibility of recovery. We, we, it's really easy for us to believe in because we see it and we're living it and we're watching other people do the same. And we get to hold people's hands and walk with them on that journey. We remove barriers. Um, I, I, again, I've been in sustained recovery for 25 years. I went to 13 treatment centers before I was able to get stable, get this 25 years, because it's a hard thing to do. From the outside, it looks kind of straightforward. Just stop. On the inside, it's a whole different ball game. Those of us who've lived that journey better understand that because we had to live it and overcome it. And there's a lot of barriers to getting help, getting healthy. So we I'll help people remove barriers. You were talking about the barrier in this community, for instance, around people getting access to detox and inpatient treatment, outpatient treatment. So we we hold people's hands to give people a rise to facilities across the state, whatever we can do in the moment to help somebody move one more step further to becoming healthier. Um, so we're all about recovering, connect people to recovery support services, um, to different recovery kinds of groups. We have groups ourselves we talk about here shortly. Um, we understand, again, because of our own experience, how helpful it is to have someone that you can trust and believe in, and you feel like you're not being judged when you have those engagements, as you kind of turn, your, as I, I rephrase it, is you turn your 6 0 inside out. That's what you kind of have to do to, to get to that place where, um, find, where you can get open and up to get the kind of support and help you need. And we are all about encouraging hope, optimism, and healthy living and healthy choices. We help each other, each, each, each of us helps one another, each of us to live a healthier life. I, you, you saw the phrase of that, men on Men know Bimadza win, right? <laughs> to, live, to live in a good way. Uh, that's the real core of, of it all. Because part of what happens is when we live in a good way, is it, it supports our self-esteem, it supports our self-worth, and it makes that makes that doing that fight a lot more um, more important, you know, getting a more 
more committed to the fight you have to you have to go through as you see yourself get healthy. Okay. These are um, some of the services that we provide, and we do provide these services in in Isabella County, particularly in targeting the reservation community, which Anna will talk about a little bit later. Um, we 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 train recovery coaches. I am a trainer of recovery coaches. We train them in professionalism and ethics and how to be better listeners and motivational interviewing. We bring a lot, because we understand people People have a passion to help, but sometimes they don't have the skill sets to help very effectively. So we help people become more effective with their passion to be useful to other people. Um, we put on a lot of recovery events. We want people to see the beauty and reality and the joy on the other side of that difficult choice of becoming, moving away from substance disorder. And they won't see it, it's easier to see it if you can put, put it in their laps. So all of our services are free of charge. We always have food and we don't like say, take one hot dog and go away. It's like, how many <laughs> hot dogs you want? Get the hot dogs, get busy, come on back, get some more. Right? Bring, bring the whole family out and everything is free. Um, and and, and Adam's gonna kind of, kind of talk through a few of those events that we've had in this community over the last year or so. Um, and then we do, as, in addition to group level activity, we also engage one on one with individuals um, around whatever their particular issue or need, need may, may be today. We have a lot of social support groups. We have at least four groups on Zoom every day, sometimes the six on Zoom every day. And then we have face to face groups around our territory, about 20, 20 of, of those a day. So we have a lot of access to support groups, again, free of charge, no judgment. And we accept people right where they are. We don't dictate how people get better. We help them with the, support, the choices they make to get better. We don't tell somebody you have to do it like this or you can't come in here if you act like that. We understand it's a difficult process. You need a place where you can land and feel safe so you can do that, journey, do that recovery journey. Okay. These are just, again, I mentioned the trainings. These are an array of kind of trainings that we, we routinely provide our, our recovery coaches and anyone interested in promoting recovery, period. Folks don't have to be, become a recovery coach to benefit on learning how to be a better listener. In fact, when I started learning how to be a better listener, I, I took it home to my wife and things got better. I listened better. <laughs> I got trained. And so we want to help people become better listeners. Uh, so these are a variety of trainings that we provide. Um, for, for recovery coach. Again, all of that is free of charge. We feed people all day while they're there, um, the, the, the whole shoot match. And people get a lot of benefit from it. It's really, really cool to see. Yes. I want to also speak to, we are very purposeful about being diverse. Um, we are diverse geographically. We are in rural communities. So we serve you know, the rural white population. We serve um, the more diverse inner city population, Saginaw Bay. Um, we are obviously in Isabella County with a very purposeful and specific programming um, that we call the Healing Force um, um, here with the tribal community. Lots of women and men and youth are running around with us as well. Um, all, so we have, we, we have a very diverse um, organization. And, and out of that diversity is the reason we wound up coming to Isabella County. We were invited to come to Isabella County, by the way, by um, the Behavioral Health Facility um, on, 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 um, on tribal land. They came, we heard that there was a talking circle um, and we said we support all pathways, all styles of recovery. And we understood it was a sober, a sober talking circle. We had never been there before. So our team loaded up and just went to support that activity, support that activity. And through that process, the individuals that from the, from the tribal behavior facility um, became aware of that I, we were putting our money where our mouth was and that we were, could be respectful or we would honor traditions and all of that. And so they asked us, can you come over and try to be helpful a little bit further west, a little bit further west. And over to a year or two of, of, of a tepid, you know, of, of small attempts, we ultimately grew, ultimately we got funded by Mr. Health Network to be fully involved in Isabella County about two and a half two years and five months ago. Okay, Anna. Okay. All right, again, so I'm Anna Winters and I'm just gonna talk about really briefly, hopefully about um, the recovery on the res, which is kind of the the term that has been coined um, for Pier 360 and what 
to my this is what it is how I can explain it the most in my head sorry I'm a little nervous um so there's already established pathways to recovery multiple all kinds of different ways and peer 360 is really adamant about accepting all kinds of pathways to recovery whatever it looks like for you that's what works here we'll meet you where you're at so in the tribal community where I'm from I struggled a lot. I couldn't find a pathway that worked for me. Um, I just couldn't. It and, and a part of that was um, another another term that we like to use as culture is prevention. And so there's been a loss of culture in the tribal community due to boarding schools and, and historical trauma and other unfortunate incidents. Um, so there's this loss or this gap uh, where there's a disconnect from culture. And so what we've been trying to do, what I've been trying to help do is bridge the gap. So helping people who are disconnected from their culture get reconnected, but also get their feet um, underneath them in pathways to recovery that are already established that work for them. And then trying to combine um, getting reconnected back with their culture and then getting in line with uh, pathways that are to recovery. So kind of making the two and two go hand in hand and work together. One of the things that we um, refer to is called walking the red road. And going back to the first screen that we showed, the mental bamads went to live in a good way. Walking the red road is like a metaphor for walking in a good way. And so the, the red road is like a, like a medicine road or a medicine path it's good medicine it's a good way to live it's a good way to be um it's the road to healing and so our, the idea behind that is to help people find the red road and help them to stay on the red road as best as we can whatever that looks like for them um culture awareness and inclusion again back to the culture's prevention we try to um bridge uh cultural teachings cultural lessons cultural um, activities and then we blend them with social activities so that people come out and they get a teaching about their culture and then like Ricardo had mentioned we feed them we have prizes it's a social thing families children get to see their parents now you know volunteering at tables and registering people and helping set up and clean up and living in a good way versus you know unfortunately for example, uh, my children don't have to see me walking into the courthouse or going to see my probation officer or whatever it may be. Now they get to see me um, doing work for the community, feeding people, volunteering, living in a good way. Um, so it's about that role modeling, but it really does start with that family reconnecting and that culture is prevention. And so we just really try to bridge the two together. And this is um, a couple of the events that we had done on the screen back here and it's just bringing families together we provide safe spaces for people to come they're alcohol and drug free and like ricardo said food fun family free prizes it's just a really good healthy way to reconnect some of the things that are highlighted here on this picture here we took a bus trip down to the uh, muskegon museum of art and we took anybody who wanted to come. If you're in recovery, support recovery, you were interested, you wanted to go, it was free of charge. Everybody got on the bus. We went down to the museum and we seen an exhibit by a Native American artist, um, fed everybody, played games. And it's the same with all the events that we do. And back to, uh, and the, back to the parenting part. So the good role modeling. So children being able to see their parents living in a good way today. Um, a lot of children who have parents, in my experience, that have uh, suffered with substance use disorder don't necessarily get to see their parents growing and being in safe spaces and helping people and being role models and living in a good way and reconnecting. Um, the little shirt up there kind of says it all, like my dad is in recovery. So children are proud to see their parents in these places and spaces. And then you want to touch on this, Ricardo? Thank you. And um, we tried to squeeze it all in best we could. Since we've been funded by Mr. Health Network, um, I did it, I ran the number like this last night. We that, so in two and two years and five months, we've pro provided 482 separate activities, and we have over nine by nine almost 9,200 people have participated in those activities since we've been involved in, in the Bellas County. Um, so that's what we do. And just also, you know, so you know that although our activities are targeted toward the reservation, we do have other participants in Isabella County who come to those meetings, who come to our events, and all those events and activities that we do are open to the public. Anyone who supports recovery, seeking recovery, impacted by recovery, desiring recovery, um, I welcome in every activity and event that we do in groups. Here's our information for contact. Um, Anna's contact number is here. She is our person on the spot 
here in Isabella County. And um, and that ends our presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. Question. Yes, sir. Custom permission, Maria. Yeah, um, they can hear me. Um, I was wondering, do you have any harm reduction uh, elements in your program? <clears throat> yes, we do. Um, one of the things, a number of things, we uh, we do we do teach teach <laughs> teach we teach we train on how to use Narcan, mm -hmm. and we and we distribute Narcan, um, which you all anybody does Narcan right? You overdose reversal, good. Um, we also distribute um, fentanyl test strips. Great. Increasingly, there's fentanyl, and um, and of course, because our our we support all pathways and styles of recovery, we really welcome people who use medication assisted services. So, if you use suboxone or methadone or mm -hmm. Vivitrol, or if you have mental health challenges and use mood stabilizing medication, our doors are open. There's some other recovery spaces where the doors are not open, but ours are open. So we support harm reduction. Thank you. You are. Thank you for the question. I have one. So the people that come to Pier 360, are they uh, just walk-ins? Are they referrals? Are they, uh, how, how does They're that? They're referred. They walk in. <laughs> um, right. A number of individuals come to our, 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 our services who are referred by the courts. Um, and some people, and they're mad about being there. We really don't care. I understand you being mad. Uh, feel feel free to come here and be mad. It's all right. Better, better going back to the courthouse because of somebody out, right? Be mad here. So we so so we um so people we have referrals from treatment treatment centers. Um, we are, we're all we're very open. We're on Facebook. We got a website. Um, we are not anonymous. Like I said my name is Ricardo Bowden. Take it, use it. Um, we are not anonymous. Um, so we are very open to the public. Does that speak to your question? Um, yes. Yeah. Thank Mr. You. Hope. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. How far is your footprint? How far are you? I see you're from uh, Bay City. Are you just purely Michigan or do you go? <laughs> we are purely Michigan. Um, we, we are specifically funded to be active in eight counties. Um, Aranac, Bay, Saginaw, Midland, Tuscola, Huron, Shiawassee, Bay Isabella, and we also have a smaller footprint um, working in Sandlot County to help build some capacity over there. This year as well, we've been invited to actually be involved with the Inner Tribal Council of Michigan. So we'll be doing some some trainings for people up in the Sault Ste. Marie um, this coming summer. So our reach is growing that way. Recently too, we had someone ask us about being useful over Manistee. Um, so. Yeah, well, so we we have we're on our toes. We, I don't know how we're going to do all that, but we keep trying to show up, try to show up, do the best we can. But no, we are not outside of Michigan. Although on our Zoom meetings, people do zoom in from California. Somebody was zooming in from Alaska before, down south. So we get those kind of participants, but um, we, we're not like boots on the ground outside the state. You're welcome. I have one more question, if yes, you don't mind. So it, your funding comes from Mid-State Health Network, then do you work with the CMHs pretty closely or? We are not, unfortunately those silos still exist. Um, so we are not like hand in hand with um, CMH. However, we do have programming that allows individuals who have mental health um, diagnoses to be involved in what we do. We do have in, over in Tuscola County, we have a collaboration <laughs> with the peer, is a, um, the peer Center, which, which is a CMH facility targeting um, focal, um, mental health challenges. So we have a collaborative collaboration there is very, is very active. Yes. Yeah. We have another question. Yes, sir. Um, are you aware of the Isabella County Community Collaborative that meets the first Friday of each month uh, at the Commission on Aging here. I think it's at nine o'clock. And it's all human services organizations uh, collaborating and sharing information and all that. The answer to that is, <laughs> but we will. Great. It's a good way to get referrals or get your message out and so forth. Okay. We're, we are on it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're on it. Okay, 
Well, once again, we really want to say miigwech. Um, I'm, I'm not Native American, but she is, she taught me, which means thank you, Chi miigwech, thank you very much for having us. Um, so there it is. And if we can be of use to you in any kind of way, please feel reach, reach out to us. Put the word, let's get the, put the, put the, put the word out in the community as best you can. Um, we would love to be as helpful as we possibly can to people. We understand the suffering and the challenge and the stigma associated with substance use disorder. And uh, we want, uh, we're standing in a space where we're having some positive impact. We want to grow that impact uh, as much as we possibly can. And with that, we need partners in the community. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Okay, up next we have the Isabella County Administrator Controller Report. I'd just soon not follow that. <laughs> that's, uh, oh my goodness, uh, that's a lot of impact. Almost 10,000 individuals in two and a half years. The stuff on my report doesn't seem, doesn't seem as important anymore. Um, but thank you so much for allowing them to come and present to you at any time you see something um, on a report that you don't know what it is, please say something. We can get folks here to present. I learned so much. I didn't know what they were, what the what three peer, peer 360 was until Commissioner Marino asked the question and I reached out to find out. So um, please, if, if you're if you're um, seeing things you don't know what they are, let's let's get folks here so we can all learn. So I have a big uh, Big report of gratitude today. As I as I went through here, I think um, everything is is just a, a thank you, and in, in no particular order whatsoever. Um, those of you, uh, several of you commissioners, attended the Council of Governments meeting last Wednesday night and learned about a new uh, the settlement table that we'll be using on the the wind turbines for the, the industrial personal property tax depreciation schedule. And we're going to use one that is a little more beneficial to us than, than it, we had originally thought. And I need to thank the outgoing, retiring uh, Gratiot County Administrator Tracy Cordes for uh, basically letting us know that that was going on and encouraging the, the attorney uh, who represents the, the WIND Coalition to reach out to us. So thank you very, very much, uh, Tracy, for that. Um, I do want to let you know that our fiscal 22 audit is wrapping up. Auditors were on site to do field work uh, right after the first of the year. And um, just today I've received draft documents. So myself and the accountants will be going through the audit draft. Um, we've got two weeks to get changes back to the auditors and then they'll be here a second um, meeting in March to present uh, the audit to the board. So a big thank you to accountants, Chris Whitmer and Melissa Frankwist. Um, Melissa takes the lead on budget and audit. So thanks to both of them. MERS uh, was here recently. They were on site, oh, maybe a month ago, sat with Commissioner Embry and I and um, showed us how, how to use a new tool that they have um, procured for all their members. It's called a total liability calculator. And it's something we can use to uh, input assumptions maybe that are different from MERS assumptions, like the, the um, poor performing year that they've just had, right? Um, MERS assumes 7% uh, rate of return and last year ended around negative 10%. Uh, so understand that's a negative 17% swing, if you will. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the forecast section um, of the agenda, but I did want to thank uh, Tony Regenovich as our regional manager and thank him for coming on site. Very valuable tool that they've given us, especially given this last year and the performance of it. We can actually build, instead of waiting for our MERS valuation in June, we can actually build some of these new assumptions into that. So it just makes it a lot more meaningful. I want to say, uh, if you didn't know, our north doors are open at the county building now. They're no longer locked during, during business hours. And I just want to say thank you to the department heads for pointing out maybe when, um, 
when I need to be reminded about um, the value of things. I, I, I didn't know that it was causing some issue with staff. As you can imagine, staff is coming in the door, public's at the door, no, I can't let you in. And there, there's, there's conflict there, right? And there's, there's hurt feelings and it's hard to be consistent. And Sheriff, thank you for explaining to me that no, Nicole, the building is really not safer just by having that door locked. So thank you, everybody. I think we do have a better a better um, situation out there now. I want to thank uh, Mark Griffiths and his new emergency management coordinator, Helen Lee. Uh, she, I know her. she just started. Yes, we, we have a hire. We're so excited. Um, they have both been already, I think Helen's not even on the job a week yet, maybe, and already is, is helping all of the departments. We're doing this in conjunction with our monthly department meeting through a continuity of operations planning process, right? So what if the big what if, what if the county building burned to the ground kind of thing? Our plan, Jen, if you didn't know, was to all come out here and set up shop, assuming you're not also built, they're burnt to the ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark is just kind of working through all the departments to say, okay, if that happened, what would you need, right? What would you need to set up shop out here? What 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 are the functions that you would still have to do? So it's going to be a few month long process working through that. But I think it's important, right? If nothing else, just if we all just have a little memory of about it when whatever it is it happens, then it'll it'll definitely be worth it. Remember, we increased our our uh, response time for the fire drill from twenty two minutes to exit the building down to six. So we we do need to practice, practice, practice. One of the things on the invoice list, you might have seen sage removal services. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, what that is. It's not, it's not ambulance service, right? It's not um, live patient, urgent, medically needed, you know, ambulance service. This is these sage removal services is for non-emergency transport services to the morgue, basically, right? And this is one thing that I know after I first started last year, Sheriff had expressed concerns about um, the length of time. Sometimes it took on a scene to clear the scene, to have MMR show up and to transport a non-emergency transport. Uh, we want MMR to focus on their live patients. That's what they want to. And so sometimes our sheriff deputies, our medical examiner investigators were held up on, on scene for a while. So Enter a um, couple, maybe three, four months ago, SAGE removal services. Again, this non-emergency transport situation is, it surfaced as an alternative for us. MMR is thrilled um, because they, they want to focus on, on those, those live emergency situations. So it doesn't go against the contract that we have with MMR. You know, we have one for ambulance services and we have another contract <laughs> with them for the, this non-emergency transport, but it's not an exclusive um, contract. And it even says in there that they can come up with backup transport. So it's finally here. I think uh, we're just getting rolled out. Maybe he's been active for about a month, but um, Sheriff had obviously had to put some protocols together uh, for, for how they're going to be contacted. Um, but I think it's all working out good. So I'm happy for that. Thank you, Sheriff, for, for agreeing to do all of that and being open to it. Uh, speaking of council governments last week, um, I, it's kind of funny. I have this on my list, but um, every time I say the pledge with you guys, I have a pause in there that you'll notice. And I have a loud voice. So you'll notice someone is always off cadence. That's me in this group, I feel like. But if you ever want to see a group, say the Pledge of Allegiance with, with cadence that is chilling, go to the Council of Governments meeting because they're really, really good at it. <laughs> um, last month, uh, last month, last week at two o'clock on Thursday, Lisa Hoppy from 44 North gave an insurance refresher via Zoom to the employees. And this was kind of in response to some of the um, the issues we've had and rolling out some of the changes we've made this year. That was recorded. So if you missed that, um, please let myself or Emma know. And I think we can connect you with that recording. So thank you, Lisa. Happy for coming uh, to give 
to give that refresher. Insurance committee, as a reminder, is meeting this Thursday also, Thursday afternoon. I want to say thank you to Tim Neport uh, for stepping up to serve on the airport joint operations Manage and management board sounds right and i want to apologize for the to the board for not for not understanding or knowing that it couldn't be one of you that sat on that committee and jessica and i now vow to if it's not a commissioner appointment we'll look into the into the why so my apologies um but thank you for your grace in that regard um all in all i just want to thank the board for um having a supportive supporting a culture of transparency and good governance. Um, not all county boards do. It's very much appreciated. Uh, not necessarily linked, but uh, you know we've received the opioid money, certainly happy for that, but Ottawa, Ottawa County has filed an appeal. So the, the dollars, you know, we've already received them, so it's no longer holding that up. Certainly, if they're successful in that appeal, it could affect future amounts if they come into the pool. But as of right now, it is their appeal is not affecting us receiving those monies. Excuse me, if I'm correct, they are they had already held it up before, right? Yes, they did. They did, but they've and the decision was not in their favor. But now they've of course appealed that. Got it. So. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, I think the the last thing I want to um, to talk about in my report, or the last person I I need to thank, unbelievably, this kind of came up on us so quick, but um, Suzanne Kopmeyer is leaving us after 23 plus years um, as our Parks and Recreation Director. Shocking to me. I don't know if if many of you know that uh, Suzanne is part of the reason I got into to Parks and Recreation back then I won't say how many how many years ago first part of my career and and uh really enjoyed it wouldn't wouldn't have done it probably without Ms. Kottmeyer um so I just want to say thank you to her and and the service that she's given to to this county and our parks she's tidying things up so good before she goes but also want to say thank you to Miranda Walker um our interim parks director uh, for stepping up we do we do love to promote from within, and, and this is a fantastic opportunity for her. So glad to see her step up too. So lots of gratitude here. Lots of gratitude. Any questions about what I've been up to? That's I've got to ask the dumb and obvious question, but if I don't ask it, it's going to bother me all the time. But on the depreciation schedule extended, um, it comes up to the assessors, correct? It does. And they've been contacted. They all are updated on what form to use and not. I know it seems obvious, but sometimes what seems obvious to other people sometimes doesn't get followed through on. So I know we're dealing with at least two assessors, maybe more. I believe four in total. And um, Pete Preston has reached out to those assessors. Um, several of them were in attendance at Council of Governments Wednesday night to hear the same thing. Okay. And they're a little nervous, rightfully so, right? Because they're diligent in what they do, and they know the rule is, you know, to, to use that state tax commission multiplier, they know the rule is whatever DTE as the owner of the turbine sends them by, well, by yesterday. Um, yeah, it's February 20th is personal property tax statement deadline. Um, but, but what we've been told by DTE is that, yes, they will use the state tax commission multipliers to submit their February 20th values because they don't have time to do anything else but shortly thereafter a week or two the new multiplier values will be used to to send so they'll send the settlement multiplier values in and tell the assessor you can use either one we're trying to get out in front of that and have the assessor use the settlement table in the beginning to begin with if they don't do that it's okay because we still have march board review right in that process Anyone can go and argue the value of something. It doesn't have to be the property owner. So we can use the March border review process to apply the settlement table there or the July border review if we had to. How uh, else do you think anybody from DTE will be at the border review for individual townships to do? So are the border reviews at the township levels yes. where yes. they could? So it's possible, but one of the things that the attorney told us for the coalition is that DTE wants uniformity. 
and that we, Isabella Wind Park 1 and 2, would be the only wind parks using that state tax com commission depreciation table on DTE-owned turbines in the whole state. And so we don't think DTE is going gonna, is gonna to fight it. And, and the attorney for the coalition knows the attorney for DTE, and he reached out, yeah. and that's how we found out that a week or two later they're going to be sending in the values with the settlement multiplier. So we do feel confident, and I said, what's the worst thing that could happen? DTE could sue us. And basically the attorney said it'd be about a 30 second appeal where we would, you know, we could just, we could pull back and use the other multipliers, but we just don't, we don't see that happening. And the coalition is also um, seeking a legislative fix that basically will say, here's a law and here's a statute that says assessor. If you have utility scale wind turbines, you use this depreciation scale. The one that they're talking about using for that statute is the settlement table and DTE is in agreement with that. So it would it would really upset DTE's apple cart, I think, to, to come after us for using the settlement tables the way you know it was described to, to Pete and I on the phone with the attorney, the way the way we understand it. And that that's what's given us the confidence to urge the assessors to do what they know isn't right to do right now. Right. It's it's against their process, but so we'll trust, we'll trust, and we're about to verify. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, sir. So we're losing uh, Sue Ann to Parks and Recreation. And I, I heard that her last, well, she's got some PTO time that she needs to take, but is there an active search on now for her replacement? Because I know uh, it can be a very hectic time in the spring when you have new staff coming in, training, and a whole lot of stuff can be overwhelming the system, so. That, well, there's not a posting out yet, but um, it, no, we're not we're not actively, but we will be. We will be. I don't I don't want to, you know, make I don't want to make any presumptions about timeline. I guess at at this point, because you're right, it is it is a tough time of year for parks to to have a change. Um, but part of the logic behind their season gearing up in Sue Ann, basically, if you will staying on as, as a resource, right? Because she'll be on PTO for a little bit here, she'll be very available to us and to, to Ms. Walker. And we'll figure out, we'll figure out a plan. She does have a pretty competent staff. But... Indeed she does. Indeed Thank she you. Does. It's not something you're interested in getting back how much, into. How much does it pay? <laughs> <laughs> Can I double dip the county? <laughs> you cannot in that regard, sir, no. <laughs> You'd have to make a choice. <laughs> Sir? And we have two other people retiring in that uh, same night. So it is uh, Thursday, the 23rd. Weather, hopefully, the weather holds for us one to four in room 320. Thank you. Um, it, you know, I've, I've known Paul Gross longer than I've known Sue Ann. So uh, he did, he, uh, I, I told Paul Gross the other day, I said, I don't know how I'm going to walk in this building without you being here. So we can't figure out exactly how many years he's had, uh, but over 31 is, wow. is what I understand. It's a lot. Um, Long time. Yeah. Paul's an icon for the county, certainly. And uh Will great will be greatly missed, and the other the other retirement um, is Lisa Hoisington in our community development office, also with thirty one years of service to the county. Almost a hundred years. There. Thank okay. you. Any more questions? Thank you, Ms. Frost. You're welcome. Um, we'll move along then. T appointments to boards and commissions. Uh, this evening we'll consider appointing one member to the Isabella County Jury Board for a six year term ending April 30th, 2029, or until a successor is appointed. And that person is Linda Ellis, who is currently serving in that regard, and she wants to continue. So, bless her heart for doing that. Um, does anyone want to speak to that appointment? 
Okay, hearing nothing, we'll keep moving. Uh, committee reports, Finance and Administration Committee. Our first item of business for this evening is consider ratifying and placing on file the February 3rd, 2023 invoice list in the amount of $1,772,647.27. The February 10th, 2023 invoice list, the amount of $271,000. $651.65 in the adjustment list dated February 16th, 2023. On the first invoice list uh, dated uh, February 10th, uh, I, I did note that the Isabella County Conservation District was uh, the big payout. Uh, they did get 2% uh, money for electronic waste recycling. I know I participated in that program uh, last year and it was a lot of people there. And I have a garage full of stuff again this year. So I'm glad to see they got the funding. Uh, all the rest of them in, the, in that particular thing uh, 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 list are pretty much uh, familiar to us, routine, routine payments. On the February 3rd list, I see the state of Michigan. Uh, and I'm just going to point out a couple of things I noticed is kind of different. The state of Michigan is 44,000. That's a fire safety plan examination fee. Must be like the state fire marshal um, is like a building inspector goes through the, uh, the documents and make sure that we're compliant with uh, fire safety rules. Got it. This is on the, the new sheriff's office and correctional facility project. It's the licensing and regulatory affairs department. Exactly. Okay. And then as you go down the list, again, they're very familiar to us, routine uh, payments. Uh, the, the big payments going out are all third quarter 2022 tax distributions to the intermediate school districts. Um, uh, I don't know if there's any questions on either one of those two lists. Finally, we'll get down to the adjustment list. And uh, I did see there's one here for uh, Spencer Daniel Ed, uh, Elmore. Uh, it was 677.80 was the original check. It was reduced to 600, or excuse me, $33.93. That must have been a pretty thick finger on the keyboard uh, for that kind of error. I'm not sure how that would have occurred, but and then I, I see that uh, Vern, Vernon Township uh, Treasurer were making a payment to avoid a late fee. I know Gordon Food and all the rest of them that would usually uh, either make a payment to uh, get a discount or avoid a late fee, but. That one kind of struck me as a little bit odd. So do you see that where, where it's coming from? It says property tax assistant payment from Michigan Housing Assistance Fund. So it must have been someone was able to get assistance to help pay their taxes. And that money flowed through the county. And so I think there was an urgency to, to, to not... To not pay them late. It's always exciting to see a new vendor on the adjustment list. <laughs> Any other questions on the adjustment list? Then we'll move these forward uh, to tonight's meeting. Management and operations policy number 250, travel policy, take effect immediately upon adoption. There isn't for for the, for travel. There isn't a dollar amount. Um, it's just if it's out of state travel, your travel policy says two things. One is, and this has been in there, that the most economical means of travel will be you know will be used basically. And it's not. It's you can't um, you can't say the employees going to Disneyland. So you know we're we're gonna we're gonna pay for the hotel, but they'll pay for the you know the the miles that can. You know, it's it's got to be most economical for the county, and then the new part because we've we've struck the sentence that requires board of commissioner approval before the before the out of state travel arrangements are made. 
basically we've written that now into the administrator controller section in, in section 13, where it says, basically people would just have to let the administrator controller know they're traveling out of state. So it's a budget and, you know, it would be already a budgeted expense if it was a non-budgeted thing, come to the administrator controller, but very cumbersome in practice to come to this board for a, approval of such an administrative thing, especially if it's already been budgeted. Thank you for your consideration. I was just gonna say, I think it's uh, very appropriate for us to not you know, manage our department heads and we oversee their budgets. Uh, so, I mean, we have oversight. So I just wanted to throw out my uh, support for these changes. And also, um, Quite frequently, you know, training is offered out of state uh, and not in state. And so uh, we shouldn't be um, avoiding a training in the future just because it's out of state. Um, I first read this, felt as though we're kind of micromanaging something that didn't need to be micromanaged. So, yeah. yeah. Do you have any other questions? If not, we'll move this forward to the session this evening. Our third item is consider adopting Isabella County fiscal year 2024 budget calendar as presented. So we've already started that with a presentation to the finance and administration on February 14th. And we're looking at a seven month process to get down to a budget that we can, uh, that is balanced and that we can live with. Uh, it kind of, I think last year we expanded that um, calendar so that we have a little bit more time to uh, take in input from the from the public and to consider any kind of changes and uh, input from the uh, board of commissioners to uh, entertain uh, changes or modifications. Nicole, did you have anything else to say? I don't think so. You covered it. We basically stayed with the same schedule we had as last year. Very few. Things are changing, you know. I think it well it worked very well last year, and uh, glad to see it continue. We'll move this then, unless there's additional comments or uh, questions. Move this forward to our meeting tonight. Item four: Consider accepting and placing on file the fiscal year 2023 first quarter financial report as presented by our county administrator. Um, so I can hit the highlights as, as uh, they were presented at finance. Um, first page is revenues and you know this this first this first quarter report always looks very scary, right? Because we don't start to receive the bulk of our revenues until July after July 1st when the when the summer tax bills go out. And so we're well within our with our year by then. Um, so I don't even think we need to talk about tax revenue, honestly, on this one. It's just it's just not there yet. Um, as you as you look off to the right, remember our percent spent should be about 25%. This is through December of 2022. And as you look down, really, I think we're performing very, very well. If you take taxes out of out of the mix, um, federal and state. A little, there's a little behind where we normally are, but I think that is is basically <clears throat> timing. And if we've we haven't used a lot of our ARPA dollars yet, I know that we budgeted to use a lot for for capital improvements, and most of those haven't taken place yet. So that might be a little bit why it's lagging. But charges for services strong, fines and forfeits are strong, interest and rents are very strong uh, right now. You'll see a delinquent tax revolving. Remember, we part of the balancing the budget was to use two hundred thousand dollars transfer in from our delinquent tax revolving fund, and you'll see in our the next piece on the agenda when we talk about fiscal twenty two uh, preliminary ending. Originally, we had eight hundred thousand budgeted from delinquent tax and year. And, delinquent tax revolving fund in that year and ended up not using any of it. Remember that's because of, of our, our, our theory now, we're not gonna take from delinquent tax to add to general fund fund balance. If we don't need it, we're not gonna use it. So that's why we haven't transferred any of the delinquent tax fund yet. 
That's something we'll do later in the year if we need it. Uh, the other transfers in are a lot more timely, if you will. Those, those generally happen uh, quarterly. You'll see transfer in from commissary. Uh, that was to uh, cover sheriff's capital. Thank you, Sheriff. CPL fund uh, is used to help cover some of the clerk's staff. Transferring from other funds, that's from Register of Deeds Automation Fund, and that is that is one of those that's done once towards the end of the year. Transferring from indirect costs can be right on at 25% because we do those quarterly. Uh, so all told, revenues are at 6.7%. I trust me, Commissioner Embry, don't get nervous about that. It's coming, it's coming. Total revenues, if you, if you don't look at property taxes, looks a little better, a little over 17%. Um, but it always looks pretty bad this this time, this this quarter. If you look at expenditures, the important thing here, obviously, is to be on, on track at 25%. So if we look down the list, a lot, a lot of most departments are under 25%, not concerning at all. Administration is first one we see over. And what drives administration over in first quarter is our property and liability insurance. Those come out of the admin budget. Those are kind of paid. I think we've paid 50% uh, for the year, 200, 280 total budgeted for insurance. And we've paid about half of that at this point. So that's driving that admin budget up a little bit. Elections, um, clerks had most of her elections in the first first quarter this year. So that's gonna be the, hopefully maybe the bulk of that expense, but that's what's pushing her up. Other than that, if you look down, cooperative extension is the, is the last one under general government there. They're almost 50%. And that's because the contract that we have with Michigan State University for MSU extension is paid quarterly. It's always paid up front. So we've paid two quarters at this point. You'll always see that that percentage look high. Community development is just a little tick over 25% and that has to do with the escrows they have on the sight and sound study, I believe. So a lot of, a lot of that was, was happening in the first quarter as we know. Veterans Affairs is one of those departments who looks over budget, but it's because his, from his County Veterans Service Fund grant, those bus wraps and billboards that he purchases with that, um, those have been, those have already been paid for. And so that pushes his budget up. The transfers out that you see at the end of expenditures, we do those quarterly except for the MIDC transfer. Our local share for the MIDC grant is all transferred at once at the beginning of the year. Even so, we're just under 23% spent for the, um, for the quarter. <laughs> Last page is um, some of our major funds and how they're performing. Um, Parks and Rec, Commission on Aging, tax revenues are certainly not in for them yet either. So those lag, front of the court is a lag in, in reimbursements from the state. Childcare is, is one of those that's actually been performing really, really well. Remember, we no longer are in that situation where the state reimburses us. Um, I'm sorry, no longer in, in the in the scenario where we charge the state. They pay first. Um, and so that's actually helped the timing of things, but um, revenues are down mostly because expenses are down in, in child care funding in front of the court, which is great, which is great news. Uh, Central Dispatch doesn't get taxes for the revenue, they get surcharges. And the surcharge that we received in the first quarter is basically due to fiscal 22, so that always gets pushed back. So that's why you see such a low amount for revenue in Central Dispatch. Uh, recycling and inspections, both performing pretty well. There is a little lag in revenues for recycling because those do um, get billed out, those get invoiced. Uh, as far as expenditures, you can see that all of all of your funds are performing really, really well. So. 
I know it seems a little scary uh, to not have those tax revenues in yet, but that's mm -hmm. just our business plan. It works. Mm -hmm. And um, in the next agenda item, we'll show you how it can work. But before we move on to fiscal 22, is there any questions about 23, first quarter? Just uh, another piece of this puzzle is uh, this forecast doesn't change a whole lot for the next two quarters as we wait for the uh, taxes to come rolling in late in the year. And so uh, what does keep up is the expenditures. Yeah. So we have to rely upon cash flow. And uh, I know I've had some issues with some of the uh, ways we've managed a cash flow in the past, but uh, uh, I did pose that at the uh, committee and given assurances by our illustrious uh, administrator controller that we do have sufficient resources to, to get us there. At some point down the line, we may not have those resources. We may have to take a look at a, a short-term loan to get us through the, the, the financial squeeze that we seem to have for the first uh, three quarters of the year, but we won't have to do that, I don't think, this year. Do you have any other questions? Doc, we'll move this forward to this evening's session. Next item is uh, consider on the wrong page. <laughs> Time out. Consider accepting and placing on file the fiscal year 2022 preliminary fourth quarter report as presented. I'm sure this is uh, in advance of our, our audit findings. Uh, I'm going to let Nicole explain uh, some of the fine, fine points here, but I'm going to steal the thunder in that it does say that we are going to add $707,000 to our uh, uh, fund balance. So that's good news. That is really good news. Yes. And remember uh, last summer when we were trying to balance the budget, we ended up using just over $300,000 of fund balance to balance the budget, right? So went from original budget using $300,000 worth of fund balance. We had an amended budget that added almost 500000 in fund balance and then ended the year um, preliminarily adding $700,000. So a million dollar swing, right, from budget time. Um, I mentioned that finance. I know last year during that process, then Commissioner Horton um, had kind of encouraged us, hey, at the end of the year, we always have something left on the table, right? And we weren't, we weren't really too motivated to cut at that point, but it is a million dollar swing from, from what we thought use of fund balance so it's pretty interesting to me honestly but we're we're about to embark on that process again so just just keep that in mind you absolutely stole my thunder commissioner dalzinski but um that's okay it's it's definitely good thunder to steal you, you indicated a million dollar swing but wouldn't have been one and a half million since we didn't have to draw against a tax uh delinquent tax revolving fund yeah, and we didn't use, you know, you'll notice federal and state uh, revenues on here. Why is it so low, right? It should be 100% if we we're good budgeters. It's at um, just under 67%. We had budgeted to utilize $1.6 million of ARPA towards um, public safety payroll in the budget, towards payroll in general, I suppose. And through our through through the course of the year, we didn't we didn't have to do that. We didn't have to recognize those ARPA dollars to balance the budget. So we didn't. We left it in our lost revenue kitty. We still have that in our ARPA dollar. So it's even a bigger swing than that, because you know, yes, the eight hundred thousand from delinquent tax, the one point six from ARPA, we went two million dollars unspent for expenditures. We we will get to that. I think it's like probably on your third page here. But you'll you'll see we're underspent by two million dollars. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, one of the one of the things before we leave revenues though, I, I do want to talk about and he he doesn't well, yeah, he toots his own horn sometimes, but he hasn't about this. Um, and I want you to know when the ARPA, well, it wasn't ARPA, it was coronavirus funds were were coming about. Sheriff grabbed onto a, a grant that we could use for 
coronavirus related expenditures in the jail. And he filled it out. And I think there was a whole bunch of money available and about 12 of his colleagues filled it out statewide and came out. They said, well, you're only 12 that, that did this 12, 13. We'll just divvy up the money among all of you. So Sheriff in his wisdom was trying to find COVID expense. What, what could qualify for COVID expense? That young man was able to get this county over $350,000 for this grant to cover inmate medical services because the WellPath did COVID checks and they, they documented what they did. And we, he was able to show that that's what it was used for. That's, wow. that's what, otherwise, if he didn't do that, we'd be a little, a little south of where we budgeted, right, for revenue. So Kudos, I can't tell you how important that is for all departments to, to see what's out there grant dollar wise, but thank you, Sheriff, because he, that was, you know, that, that was huge. It was probably six months ago. You probably didn't hear anything about it, but you need to know that. It's one person taking the time to fill out one application. So thank you, Sheriff. I'll tweet your horn for you today. Uh, so let's see. Revenues didn't come in as we thought. Tax, taxes were, um, we were just about $200,000 shy of where we thought we would be for taxes. And we talked a little bit about that in finance. Um, so treasurer had a few tax tribunals, right? Where tax tribunal cases where businesses go. Uh, we talked about it in finance, a lot of it being um, some of our local ap apartment complexes with less and less um, occupancy are claiming uh, less value at tax tribunal and the state tax commission tax tribunal is allowing that. So when you're, what, you're, what your taxes are based on is your property values, right? So when those lower, your taxes lower and sometimes they'll do that retroactively. And so the treasurer actually had to, you know, to pay back. So that is why we are, about $200,000 shy of, of our tax revenue. So something else to keep in mind, uh, certainly this budget season. Those are really, I think, the big anomalies with revenue. I wanted to talk about why federal and state was so low. We just didn't recognize the ARPA dollars because we didn't need to um, transfer in from other funds. Again, as I pointed out in the first quarter this year, that's a Register of Deeds Automation Fund. If you'll recall, she had a change in how that was operated last year. She had a change in, in who oversaw that. And I think, I think there wasn't a lot of activity in that uh, program last year. So there was not a need to, to transfer as much. On expenditures, you will not see any department overspent. Um, that's something we work hard throughout the year to perform budget amendments to, to try and keep all departments um, within budget. Major funds are, are presented on the last page and the story really looks good for them too. Recycling is the only one that was overspent just a hair, but their revenues um, really outperformed what was budgeted. So nothing scary there. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was nice to see that they were over budget on that because it's always been a struggle. Unfortunately, that had to do a lot with commodity prices. For a while there was really, but they have really stabilized and come down. So we're kind of back in the same situation we were before. But for a while there, it was really nice. And maybe, you know, we're going to get to a point where we can market some of this. So but it's really dependent on the commodity prices and unfortunately the world market, what they're paying. So um, it was nice while it lasted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am um, sorry. One thing that uh, I learned in the committee that I found quite surprising, and I know we've looked at uh, payment of bills and we see that uh, tax tribunal will have reduced taxes and we're reimbursing 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. And so it's added up to our, our lack of revenue in taxes. But what I didn't know is that if it's based on like a 40% occupancy drop, if that occupancy goes back to 100% uh, because of headley, we don't recover, you know. It's a it's a permanent loss in uh, revenue uh, to the to the taxpayers or to the entities that need those taxes. 
Any other questions or comments? Just one real comment on the tax revenues and everything. Probably in the last three or four months, there's been some tax or land sales for agricultural, and they shocked me how they're still going up at quite a rate. So, um, of course, that affects the average and affects what we're being taxed on as landowners. But um, I thought that there would be a decrease in the values, but no, there's there seem to be a lot of uh, investment groups uh, buying agricultural land in, in the county. So it is propping some of the values up. So interesting but where it goes. Thank you. Anybody else? We'll move this forward then to tonight's meeting. Next item is the 10 year financial forecast update, which I am so happy to see. <laughs> I don't know about you folks, but this, this is right in my wheelhouse. I'm uh, something I. Yeah, I just, I'm passing take. out paper in, in case you'd like to follow along that way. Um, I can certainly share my screen. I don't like think we'll do that, but we can just talk through anyway. So <laughs> maybe I should have waited to, to to hand this out. This is like when Michelle hits the record button. <laughs> it's a big number. If you don't have this in your hand, um, there's some big there's some big negative numbers happening. But basically, how you read this forecast: revenues are across the top, expenditures are kind of across the middle. That colored band in the middle is is where we would end the year revenues over expenditures, right? So you take fiscal 22, like we just talked about, looks like we're we're gonna add about $707,000 to fund balance. You go to fiscal 23 that we're in right now, why would we be adding $5 million to fund balance in this forecast? That's certainly not, that didn't come out in budget time. And that if you look up um, in the revenues, you'll see ARPA one-time use. Remember, we've been talking about that pot of ARPA dollars that's lost revenue that we just we just get to record when we're ready and then use on um, any governmental services. So we we are considering in this forecast on doing that in this fiscal year. We've already budgeted revenues to pay for these things, but if we use ARPA, then we won't use some of the monies, and that's how it gets back into fund balance. If that makes got it that makes sense. Uh, some anomalies, you'll see a one-time ARPA use in 24 also, $2.4 million. That is uh, the HVAC project in the county building. Uh, we just wanted to make sure and get that on the forecast. So down below, you'll see capital outlay really jump up in that year because of that $2.4 million um, now estimated being spent on the HVAC. There are, like I was talking about grants, there's a lot of infrastructure grants right now, a lot of federal dollars. So I am I am hopeful that maybe we can find another way to, to pay for that, or at least part of that HVAC project, save those ARPA dollars for something else. I'm trying to think of any more anomalies on that page. Um, one thing we did to improve, and I guess I will I'll share my screen screen just because this is not represented on, on your sheets. One of the thing, one of the improvements Melissa and I made in the forecast is to break out the um, the um, wages and benefits in you can see that in our if you remember in our original forecast we had wages and benefits, operations, capital outlay for each department, right? And we'd put multipliers on those and we would we would presume things. So we ended up breaking out salaries and benefits into, we've got wages, we broke out FICA, we broke out health insurances. This is everything from disability, life, health, workers' comp, defined contribution, defined benefit. And that was really important, right? Defined benefit is what we pay to MERS for the pension. Defined contribution is the county 7%. That's that's pretty easy to budget. If we increase the wage, then we put that same multiplier on FICA, right? It's just, it's, it's a more meaningful way to break it out. 
but I want to I want to bring your attention to where my cursor is at here. For this defined benefit retirement that we broke out, you had to put a separate multiplier on it of 20, almost 25% to get where we think we're gonna be next year in our payments because of their negative 10% last year. Right. That's how valuable this, I, I feel like this forecast is, we couldn't drill down like that before. We'd have to presume, well, let's give benefits a 10% increase. We don't know. So it's just a lot more meaningful, but I wanted to point that out because um, obviously it's gonna be a lot more meaningful forecast for us. Um, long story short, once we, get, once we get through these next couple of years, we consistently saw a need for around four-ish million dollars a year. Ouch. Um, ARPA dollars and our sheriff and his, his grant writing finesse are, are saving grace here for a couple of years. Um, we <clears throat> can we can we can have a couple of negative years, maybe not to this degree, but I'll, I'll scroll down so the audience can see this is this is fund balance at the end here. And with those influx of ARPA dollars, that's that's going to help us with our fund balance. We've got some cash flow needs and our um, portion of the jail project, the portion not funded by USDA, the, that's gonna be um, spent down over the next couple of years too. That's why you see this fund balance come down so severely. But then as we, as we incur those negative three, four million years, it doesn't take long to see um, 26, 27, we're in trouble, 28, we're negative fund balance. Obviously that can't happen. So that's the value of these forecasts though, right? To let you know what the need is, where we should be and what we need to change if we're not where we think we should be when we should be there, right? Um, I think those are the big, those are the, Big differences with this forecast from the last one, definitely demonstrating the need. Build in the new turbine depreciation tables. Um, oh, there's some, something I think, uh, two, two important things. One is facilities capital improvement. We built in 2024 going forward, an additional $250,000 a year in um, capital improvements for facilities. And you'll see that in the expense, in the capital outlay on your forecast, um, why that's so much. And also an additional $50,000 a year for IT capital improvements. Um, just, we don't know what's coming, but we know it's coming, right? And we know we're gonna need, or no, we know we're gonna need to fund it. So. Those were some things changed from the last forecast that we did build. We did build into this one, um, kind of make it more realistic, right? That's where we want to be. We know we're going to have capital needs. So, are there any questions about what we built in, or why, or where, mm -hmm. when the where the cliff is, when it's coming? I know you've explained it before, but um, I think that it'd be valuable to me if I heard it again what we're doing and and why we're doing uh the eight million dollar arpa one time um this year so we've really i think we've really only discussed it once here on the table so probably so i just want to start at the beginning we've got about 13 and a half million dollars from arpa the fed said anyone who received 10 million or more any jurisdiction could take 10 million dollars off top for lost revenue We haven't, we've only taken about a million of that already, maybe a million four. We, we took that in fiscal 21 in the budget. We used about a million dollars of it to help balance the budget for public safety payroll. Um, since then, we've had a few capital improvement projects that we've used it for too, phone system, 
Michelle's had some server projects. We've used it to help fund the um, senior assistant PA uh, position. To the tune of, we have about 8.6 in lost revenue left. And I think around 3 million-ish in, in other, and the direct has to be used for COVID expense. So how do we get that 10 million or now 8.6 million of lost revenue into, into our coffers? We have to use it on um, governmental services. Very, very broad, the, the Fed said. They said, we can't send it to our pension. We can't use it to build a jail. But we can use it on payroll, on public safety payroll. Specifically, if we, or any governmental purpose, we're, we're going to choose payroll because we don't have to count widgets. We, we can do it in one fell swoop. So in this budget year, even though we've already budgeted some of our revenues to pay for payroll expenses, we're gonna recognize that ARPA dollars, which means we're gonna apply it to an expense, we're gonna apply it to payroll, and then we get to recognize it as our revenue. When we do that, our revenue is gonna be really um, over, over budget in that year. So we're gonna not use some revenue over here that we budgeted for. And essentially that'll just become fund balance at the end of the year because we didn't have to, didn't have to bring it in to balance the budget. We brought in ARPA dollars instead. Once it's in our books and that's ours and we recognize it, now we can send it to MERS. Now we can build a jail with it. That helped to make sense or did that further complicate it? Nope, but that helps like a magic trick it churns it into different <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah yeah that's another way to explain it i feel like um it's 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 hard it's hard to to get your mind around um and the, the caveats around those those dollars are we have to commit it we have to decide what we're doing with it by december 31st of next year 2024 and we have to get it out the door and spend it by December 31st of 26. We'll we'll be talking about it, I'm sure, much more. Thank you. Go ahead. Paul, oh, just uh, I don't want to leave quite on it since we've been doing this 10 year budget projection, it gets us thinking. And it's I'm glad that we started doing that. Um, you know, we're looking out, you know, some negative numbers in here, but, you know, we just entered into agreement, hopefully, on the MRF facility. Uh, currently, we're putting $400,000 a year into that. Um, we do modernize, we could probably cut back half the uh, workforce, but we'd save another four and a half. And, and again, depending on the commodity prices, um, there's an opportunity actually for that to actually bring some money into the county especially if the state and the nation gets a little more into recycling and there'll be more markets available. So um, I know if it's wishful thinking at this, but this is, I think, is what we need to do to start thinking to figure out how we're going to, where we're going to go, not next year, but four or five years in there. So I'm really excited about this because I said there's an opportunity to, to fill a big part of that hole. And I think there's probably other opportunities out there. So I'm usually not so optimistic on a report like this, but I really do think there's opportunities to fill that in. So, And I wanted to add to that, um, being the new guy here, understanding that this wasn't really uh, a standard operating procedure for the administration and the county to look out 10 years, 15 years. Uh, I appreciate this, um, something I'm very familiar with something that allows us to really see where we are now, where we could be, and what we need to, gives us the incentive to figure out what we need to do to avoid these very large numbers over here to the far right after 2027. Um, what I really like about this is, one, you, you've either got to squeeze the middle, which basically comes down to services, and the last thing I want to do is start cutting services. What I want to see is where can we go with things like the MRF where we can uh, generate money in revenue 
grow that top line so that we never have to get into this conversation about having to uh, reduce services or um, eliminate services. So again, thank you for doing this. Again, this uh, gives us, it, at this point, we have time. And that's what I really like to see. We've got time. We can all sit down, discuss this without a lot of pressure and talk about, hey, well, what opportunities do we have to grow that top line? So again, thank you for bringing this to us. Appreciate the patience of everybody in the audience waiting for their turn at the, uh, to come up before us. But, and, and I apologize to uh, Nicole because I didn't think about this during committee, but I have a question now. Hi. And um, I know when we looked at the, and we have a lot of impacts, a lot of costs that, that are really challenging to us. And there's certainly not one uh, that over any other, but I know in the jail project, the uh, amount of our bond is for about 41 million and we're looking yes. at a 48 plus million dollar project. So we were thinking about closing the gap with the ARPA funds. Does the 10 year forecast consider that $8 million gap closure? Cause I know we're using this in our fund balance and, and we're paying off the bond uh, up to a certain point, but is that eight, that gap that we have that we have to finance is that considered in this uh, forecast? Yeah, do you see in the transfers outline mm -hmm. um, of expenditures in the 23 and 24 years, do you see how, you know, we're usually under 2 million, honestly, but it jumps up in those couple of years. That, that represents our portion okay. above the $41.5 million USDA loan and, and what they're going to, you know, their, their draws will help us fund. That, that is our portion of that. So those expenditures are in here. How we, you know, what monies we use for it, that, that's not known, but yes, those expenditures are in here. I figured you hadn't missed that, but I wanted to ask. I'll but, tell you, Commissioner, it was one of the last things we put in. You know, Melissa and I just go back and, well, what about this? What about this? What about, you know, and, and we go back and forth. And then at the end of it, we went, oh my God, we don't have the jail expenditures in there. So please ask those questions because- you get into the details of this and you forget. Oh, we gotta add, we gotta add that five million or whatever. So great question. Please, if your administrator is not able to point to where that is at, you ask her again. Thank you. We need to move this forward to the lights. That just said this discussion. Just this discussion, it won't correct? Mr. Sure. Chairman. This completes the uh, presentation or the work of the Finance and Administration Committee for this evening. All right. Thank you, commissioners. And that would bring us to Criminal Justice and County Affairs Committee. First first up, we have consider approving the amendment between Isabella County Sheriff's Office and the Mid-Michigan College to amend the agreement for law enforcement services entered into between both parties December 4th, 2018 and shall replace the amended dated March 4th, 2021, and authorized the board chair to sign the same. We have with, with us the sheriff, um, and uh, I guess it's an increase. It's not an increase in our budget, so that's always good. So uh, would you like to explain it, Sheriff? And then I'll ask you a question later. So uh, our program firm... It has been in place now for a few years. Uh, we've got two school resource officers who are retired um, Law enforcement officers from other agencies, they work a couple days a week. Uh, the college was handling their Fridays on their own. Uh, the program has been successful. They requested us to do that third, uh, or I'm sorry, that, that fifth day. Um, and then uh, actually was kind of negotiated and clear on their, on their end to um, do a raise from about $20 an hour to just uh, about $24.55 or $48, I guess it is. Um, so that'll help us attract, you know, these retirees that come in and want to work a few more out or a few more years, pretty light work out there. It's just visibility, but they are ready to respond and act and, and do business if they need to in an emergency. So, um, it's a pretty good gig for a retiree and real good for us, puts us a presence in the school. Uh, we did work through that 50 hour weeks. So they work 10 hour days. Um, the one, uh, SRO would then be working 30 hours that put us in this kind of conundrum of, um, a full-time, uh, benefit type, uh, area. So we backed that down. So now we're at 49 hours. 
So he'll be <laughs> one less hour. So we'll be underneath that, uh, that threshold. And, and we've, um, uh, you should have the updated stuff in your packet. Now, uh, the president of Vid Michigan college had already signed that and we have that. So we should be good. Um, no money, like I said, out of our pocket and it's a good program. And it's uh, nice to have some, some, some presence in the school. Yeah, that was, that was the only question we had was that that extra hour if it would put it in the full time. And good question. We went back and sure enough, uh, you know, that would have put us over. And so we corrected that. So is there any more questions for the sheriff? Yes. But just to comment, I'm, I'm glad that mid was uh, able to bump up that wage uh, from 20 to 24, 48. So sir, as you said, certainly that'll help. Yes. Yeah. It's a pretty substantial increase, right? So that's uh that definitely is a little more attractive. So it helps. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Any more questions for the sheriff? Uh, seeing none, we'll move this forward tonight's business session. Thank you, sheriff. <clears throat> it's considered approving the salary of the Isabella County Public Defender's position as a non-union employee wage scale pay grade 19.5 in the salary of the Isabella County Chief Assistant Public Defender position as a non-union employee wage scale pay grade 17.5 effective in the current pay period in regards to the input. <clears throat> excuse me, implementation of Michigan's Incident Defense Commission, the MIDC Standard 8. Um, we have with us uh, public defender, uh, Tom Hausman, and sorry. I Good afternoon, commissioners, Roberta Zakarski. Roberta, okay. Um, before you get into this, uh, we had quite a discussion in committee on this and because they did skip to um, Standard <clears throat> 8. Um, and I'll let uh, Public Defender Hausman talk about this a little bit, and then we can go a little bit what we discussed in committee. So, sure. Um, everyone knows for the past couple of years with the with the creation of Michigan Indigenous Defense Council um, that every county had to come up with a plan to comply with all of the standards, um, and so we've been doing that back since since our inception. Um, in 2019, the first four standards were passed, and we were housed in this building <laughs> a couple you know, hundred yards that way um complying with those first four standards um with our last grant application for fiscal year 23 uh standard number five was passed and that was independence from the judiciary our original plan uh, from the start was to comply with all the standards as best we could at that initial time so that we didn't have to change all the time. Every year with the grant application, we didn't have to try and comply with a new standard. We were already doing it. Um, and so back in October, uh, MIDC went out of order and they passed standard eight relation relating to uh, compensation of attorneys. Um, we've always done that on the hourly side for our contract attorneys, paying that $100 an hour, $110 an hour, and $120 an hour. Um, however, the other language in standard eight uh, tells us that for salaried employees, our comparables are the attorney general's office. Um, this originally, this conversation originally started back in October of 2021, um, prior to Ms. Sikarki joining the office, because it was noticed at that time that the position directly below her, the senior assistant public defender, um, actually ended up topping out higher than, not even topping out. And I think about year three or four, it ended up making more money than the senior assistant position. And that was noticed back in October of 2021. We had some discussions about it. Um, and now we're at the point, the, the reason being bringing this forward now, both my salary, and Ms. Sikarski's and dealing with the others with our new grant application is because that time has come where prior to our new grant year, that conundrum is going to occur where a senior assistant is going to be higher than the chief assistant. And so that's part of the reason why bringing it forward now, we're going to have to address it with our new grant application one way or the other. It has to be in there with the passage of a new standard we have 180 days to come up with a plan for compliance. 
So the reason why MIDC passed it in October is because our grant application will be due in April. And so that's the 180 days when we submit our fiscal year 24 grant. This will have to be in it. Um, given the most recent conversation, I think it's important to note this doesn't affect uh, the local share. Um, and so, you know, it's 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 one of those things where we have to address it with our new grant application. Yeah, we've always been pretty fortunate in getting pretty much what we wanted in the grant application since we started in this. And one of our fears have been that we were not going to get what we were asked for. So uh, to make sure that this is in there on the next go around, I think it's probably very important to get it in there and then address address the other salaries as they come. Um, and like I said, it was kind of a curveball where they went right to eight. Because uh, when we set up the committee, we thought we were in pretty good shape to take care of things as they came along, but. And, and part of the reason that they passed standard eight out of order uh, relates to the next two things on the budget. It relates to a shortage of attorneys that's going on across the state. Um, and every county uh, is dealing with that right now. Um, people, they, they just don't have attorneys. A lot of people retired uh, over the past couple of years. Um, they're just, they're struggling to come up with attorneys that want to do public defender work or on the probate side of things, the neglect and abuse hearings, the juvenile delinquency proceedings, mental health proceedings, things that aren't covered by our grant. <laughs> and so what that led to was actually poaching going on across the state. Um, I can say myself, I was poached by another county. Um, counties are also trying to come up and, and, and comply with standards the same way. And, and maybe they didn't start out with public defender's offices, but we've been used as, as a model for some other counties. Um, our neighbors to the north are looking at, at forming a public defender's office. Our direct neighbors to the east are looking at forming a public defender's office with this new grant year. And so part of the, the, the issue would be is a, a retainment of our staff because there is going to be new public defender's offices opening. And, and I can, I can see that being an issue in the future. I think it's important to talk about the fact that these two positions, when public defender's office was created, were put on a wage scale se separate from they weren't given a pay grade and a you know on our wage scale they were put on what we call elected and appointed scale so you know how you set the elected official salaries in your budget every year so those are on the elected and appointed they're not on a scale you set those every year and they're subject to cola increase um, same as judges salary same as um, i'm on that scale uh, court administrator is on that scale so no other department heads are on are on that elected and appointed scale. I think in you know one of the when we did the wage study, those those positions weren't part of it, right? That 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 department didn't exist back then. Uh, so I just think it's important to talk about them being on that scale with all, all, the only incentive they get every year is a, is a cost of living increase, right? It's not on a step in, increase like our normal. Our normal scales would be. And at the time, chief deputies were set at a, it was popular to set their salaries at a percentage of the elected salaries. Um, and so my, if you can imagine this at the time, remember I was a deputy then, my salary was set at a percentage of the administrator controller. When they left, if you'd have hired someone else, that made less than her, would you have set my salary at that same percentage? You know, if, if someone came in making less than the last administrator controller and I was still deputy, would you then lower my salary to make me a percentage of that new person? No, right? I, I wouldn't appreciate that. So I think it's important to just talk about that. That logic doesn't really, really carry water with with a with an elected and their chief deputy that they can point to and they usually come with them and leave with them yes that makes that makes some sense but in this situation these folks really should should have been put on a, a wage scale like the rest of your staff so, i just want to point out that that distinction important 
timing was everything. And I, and I do know one of the things we talked about in committee also was the fact that every county would have to figure out these, these wage scales with the attorney general's office. And the attorney general's office has eight different positions. And obviously we didn't look at it and, and make our comparables at the top end. We made them comparable with, with what they already were comparable to. We didn't. So there's, there's a lot of leeway when we talk about, well, does it solve the poaching problem? Because Wayne County will be able to, there, there's a lot of leeway in there. And we went with what was most comparable to what our, our salary schedule already established was. I do think it's important to talk about poaching from within too. So we talked a little bit about a committee. If the attorneys in the public defender's office, you know, once this plan goes forward, the, those those attorneys are on this new scale. We can't be paying our attorneys in the in the prosecuting attorney's office less than our attorneys in the public defender's office. Number one, it's just not right. Number two, you're going to have poaching and. Um, thank you, Court Administrator Curtis, um, who reminded me there's also attorneys that work at the court, right? Our friend of the court and our magistrates, also attorneys. So when it comes time to looking at the uh, attorney's salaries, it's really easy to support that for public defender because our local share doesn't change. It doesn't affect general fund, um, but it, the conversation is going to get bigger than that, right? It, and it has to. But the conversation also came in how much extra it's going to cost the state to implement this eight. Yes, sir. And I know we've always been fairly uh, aggressive or ahead of the, you know, like with the drug <laughs> program. As more people get into it, uh, the pot gets a little bit smaller. So, but with this implementation of the way they did it, I, I we asked for a number. What was it? Two hundred million. And it was two hundred and twenty point nine. I think it was yeah. an increase of around yeah. seventy four total. So um, we'll keep an eye on it, but uh, we appreciate you getting on top of this, and that's it's, it's it is what it is. So yes, uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry. Yeah, the state's been pretty good at meeting the match that they promised from from the beginning. I know Frank and I worked on. Uh, setting up the, the department initially. Um, and I, I did read the information and I understand it's gonna have the impact on the prosecuting attorney's office. It's gonna have an impact on uh, juvenile cases because we have to hire uh, a, our own um, counsel for that. So you may have to expand your 10 uh, year forecast. Uh, I don't know what what your next one's gonna show, but and, you know, and those are all big concerns. We have all these impacts hitting the county where we know we're, we don't have the money to do it just a few uh, a few years down the road. And one of the things, and I know we're kind of talking about it with the next agenda item is, is the juvenile cases. And so last year, MIDC did do a study to see what bringing those under the umbrella of MIDC would cost in regards to the MIDC budget. So I'm anticipating probably within the next two or three years that those juvenile cases will fall under our umbrella. That would be good. I agree. <laughs> I like those cases. Emory. Senator Hausman, so is it your contention that the uh, wage scale, the wage pay scale that you're moving to is going to allow us to be extremely competitive or just competitive with surrounding counties who are going to be bringing in public defenders office you know I, I i obviously don't know what they would set theirs at i think what what we did was we looked at it and said when you look at the attorney general's office i think they have three level 15 say 15a 15b 15c they have a 16a a 16b and i think they have like three administrative positions as well and so what we did looking at this proposed compensation scale is, uh, I believe it's 15A, 15B, and 15C for our assistant, senior assistant, and chief assistant. And then mine was that one above it, which is like, I think, 16B. So we we did go at the, the lower end of those scales just because 
it, it was most closely re related to what our already established pay scale was. I'm sure that, I mean, right now you can go to, you know, some other county, you can go to Kent County and I'm, I'm sure that it's different. Um, but I think that what's proposed is, is extremely competitive in our area, our geographical area. Last thing we want to have, we get into the poaching war. And we want to avoid that at all costs and keep good people. So we got to pay to keep, keep good people. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Just a comment. But I thought it was interesting to learn that some of our neighboring counties are just now starting their own public defender's office and kind of using ours as a model, what we've done. And uh, I think that just uh, illustrates a point that we kind of got out in front of this from the get go and we're very uh, proactive about the standards and and that's thanks to a lot of people, but it was good. Nice call. Any more questions? Uh, seeing none, we'll uh, move this forward to tonight's business session. Love to have them stay for the next items too. That's <laughs> yeah, and we'll even uh, we'll add we'll add to the group. Uh, all right, number three. Consider entering into. The addendum to the agreement for the attorney services for indigent individuals october 1st 2022 to september 30th 2023 to incorporate the fee structure for assigned counsel assigned to certain juvenile cases effective february 15 2023 and authorized board chair to sign the same and so the, the reason this comes about is as we discussed is midc doesn't cover all these cases where there's neglect and abuse hick hearings mental health petitions, juvenile delinquency cases. Um, and so. Yes, yeah, we, are, we also have uh, uh, court administrator, Carrie Curtis oh. it's on Zoom. And Thank so as, as part of this was we've had over the past, the course couple of years, attorneys drop off that contract. Um, health reasons, retirement, um, going to other counties on their contract. Um, and so. Uh, we had had numerous discussions, both myself, Ms. Curtis, uh, Judge Black, Judge Jeans, and we all discussed the, the pay structure that we've incorporated for those cases for a number of years. Um, it was basically a $300 fat, flat fee that you got uh, for those cases. Juvenile delinquency, $300. Uh, neglect and abuse hearings were $300 per year that you were on that case. Um, those cases typically encompass numerous court hearings, particularly right at the front. They're very front loaded. Um, and so we sat down and we tried to determine, you know, what, what can we do uh, to attract more attorneys to take those cases um, or recruit attorneys. Um, and so those rates have been the same. I was last on that contract in 2016. Those are the same rates that we were presently paying our attorneys for those cases. So they haven't they haven't changed in quite some time. Um, I don't know if Ms. Curtis wants to talk about how they came up with the the, the financials regarding what the proposal is. Nope. Oh. Oh. Sorry, technological difficulty here. <laughs> So I think what we looked at was what was going to be affordable under the amount the county had already allocated to this line item. That was really important to us to try to balance with um, providing a, a better incentive to our local attorneys, really for the amount of work they put into these cases. Um, as Tom mentioned, um, neglect abuse cases are very front loaded. There's a lot of hearings. There's a lot of sometimes meetings, there's a lot of things going on, you know, and on those cases, you know, there's an attorney for the parent, there's an attorney for the child, there's an attorney for the other parent if they're not together. So, you know, depending on how many people are involved, you may need five attorneys for one case. So we don't have five attorneys right now. So we have to work through how we're going to make 
make it more enticing for attorneys and uh, really appreciate and show them that we appreciate the work that they put into our cases. So once we looked at that, we realized that we really needed to kind of double the initial amount um, for both our delinquency and our neglect abuse cases at the onset. And we could do that and still stay within the amount that was allocated to us. So that's really kind of the the mentality behind it. We also looked at what some other counties are doing, but that's such a mixed bag of, of what is required of the attorneys and how they are paid. Some do hourly, some do a flat fee like we do, some do a hybrid method. It's really difficult to try to find a good way to compare what everybody else was doing. <clears throat> so we thought we'd start with this and hopefully it would work out well, at least until MIDC took over the delinquency cases. Which again, I'm looking forward to. <laughs> Are there any questions? I would just say this isn't the, this probably isn't the end of it. I think you'll see a different form of this come forward before October when we redo the MAC contract. I think you'll see the way our county attorneys set up these addendums makes Tom a party to it still. And Tom reminds me the whole point of this was kind of, you know, to get him away from that, but he's a party to the original agreement. So I think the, you know, the addendums had to have him be a party to that, but I think we'll look to maybe separate those um, going forward with the next renewal. So you'll have two separate contracts. If MIDC isn't covering juveniles, Tom probably logically wouldn't be a party to the, to the new contract. Correct. I think to just summarize is, you know, this, these are fees that are, are set by the trial court here with, uh, you know, obviously much discussion with uh, administration and, and budget. And so it's, it's nice that uh, they take all that in consideration because uh, obviously I feel as a commissioner, I need to listen to the court when they, you know, set a fee, right. They know best. Right. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions, we'll move forward to uh, this forward to tonight. All right, uh, number four on our agenda, consider entering into addendum to the agreement for the attorney services for indigent individuals October 1st, 2022 to September 30th, 2023 to add assigned counsel as an additional party to the agreement effective February 15th, 2023 and authorized board chair to sign the same. Go ahead. <laughs> I was looking at Ms. Frost. Oh, yeah. yeah this is, same, same deal. This this addendum is separate because this would be needed if any attorneys wanted to come on to the contract. Given mm -hmm. these fantastic new rates, I'm pretty <laughs> sure if you approve this, but the door, they're going to be knocking on your door in the morning, Carrie, and Tom, mm -hmm. for sure. <laughs> well, great news. I have one. So I'm really right. excited to get that name on name on a line. So. That is good news. Kind of meeting with all that are interested in joining the contract as well. So I'm hoping that that works out. Right. Mm -hmm. It's good to hear good news these times with uh, staff. All right. Are there any questions for this adjustment? I'd see none. We'll move this forward to the work session tonight. And uh, that completes the business of uh, Criminal Justice and County Affairs Committee. Thank you, hope. Commissioners. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And that'll bring us down to Human Resources and Public Works Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have one item this afternoon. It is consider approving the independent contractor agreements between Isabella County and Bob Tillman as building inspector and plan reviewer, Doug Elias as the plumbing and mechanical inspector, and plan reviewer and Tim Wardwell as the <clears throat> electrical inspector and plan reviewer and authorize the board chair to sign the same. We have Tim Neaport, um, community development director here to give us the background on this. Hi, Tim. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, so this <clears throat> is uh, basically a contract uh, with um, current or uh, with some inspectors to fill in for current hired inspectors uh, when they're off on vacation. Um, each one of these inspectors are licensed in a specific trade. So with the county, 
we only have one individual that can do that work. Nobody can cross over because nobody's licensed to do so. So these independent um, uh, agreements that we have for contractors have we've had for probably 12 or 15 years maybe now. Um, we've just found uh, uh, inspectors who are um, retired, um, who enjoy coming back and doing a little bit of work when we need it. Uh, we do budget for this every year in the budget under um, uh, contractual agreements. Um, and uh, these three individuals uh, for each one of those trades, the building inspector, the plumbing mechanical, and the electrical are all three uh, past employees of ours. Um, I've hired all of them and they've all retired under me as well. So I'm happy to have the three of them um, wanting to do this work and to continue to stay um, in providing services to our to our community. So at this time, I'm just asking that uh, the, uh, uh, the board approve these agreements and uh, we can move forward with the chair's um, signature and get these three on board for the construction season, which is fast approaching. Any questions or comments on this? Go ahead. Just one comment. Yeah, I have to uh, congratulate you on getting Bob to give up some of his fishing to come and take part-time <laughs> jobs. <laughs> you know, Bob is not even Bob's not even in the county all the time. He travels back and forth, but he has uh, he has committed to come back, and he's done some for us in the past. And I'm excited to have him still uh, still doing some work for us. Yep. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> in here, none. Um, that com thank you, uh, Director, and uh, thank you. That concludes the work of the Human Resources and Public Works Committee, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, we have no intergovernmental affairs, no administrator controller issues, no unfinished business. Under new business item A, um, Vice Chairman Jelizinski, would you present that? Certainly. Consider adopting Isabella County Board of Commissioners Resolution Number. 2023-02 honoring Michigan Association of Counties on its 125th anniversary and authorize the board chair to sign the same. I won't read the resolution at this time because we're kind of getting late, but I will read it at the uh, regular meeting. But we have an organization, Michigan Association of Counties, that has represented uh, the best interests of the counties over the last 125 years. And um, it's a very noteworthy uh, resolution, very well deserved. Any, Any questions? questions? Okay, seeing none, um, that'll bring us down to general public comments. Any, pardon me? Oh, yep, I skipped right over B. Um, and B would be consider scheduling an Isabella County Board of Commissioners special meeting for the purpose of goal setting on Thursday, March 23rd, 2023 at 4 p.m. in room 320 of the Isabella <clears throat> County building located at 200 North Main Street in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And we kind of discussed this at the last meeting, checked our schedules. I think this works for everyone. Um, if not, uh, now's the time to let us know. <laughs> Actually, the last meeting was the time to let us know. But um, any any questions or comments on this? So uh, we did this last year, and uh, I think it's great. I think it's a great idea. Um, we did it on suggestion of a couple of the commissioners and. Um, it worked out well. Uh, certainly, I know that Nicole and her staff has worked hard on this 10-year forecast to get this to a point where uh, it's presentable and that we can kind of use this as a guide uh, going into that meeting. So very, very helpful. So very appreciative of that effort. So any any comments or questions about that? Seeing none, uh, we'll move that to tonight's agenda. And now we can go to general public comment. Anyone for general public comment? And I see no one. Uh, so announcements, commissioners, any announcements? No hands up raised for announcements. Uh, so is there a motion to adjourn? 
So moved. Support. Then moved and supported. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 558. Jerry. Next meeting, I'm saying.